Are we starting? If you're ready, we can use a couple more minutes. That's fine too. Just lots of time. Just a couple more minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely.
Bravo. Folks the same. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Ah, okay. I wondered if there was anybody in the room. <laughs> Uh, great to have you guys here. Uh, those of you who are here in the library, I hope you know who we are. This is Father Lawrence Salon from the monastery here, and I'm Reverend Marie-Louise Pringay, uh, and I was recruited this year uh, for the first time in chaplaincy. So thank you for... Uh, COVID has really restricted how we've been able to uh, host events or connect but this is our first live event. At least we get it in before the end of term, right? <laughs> um, anyway, in the interest of uh, truth and reconciliation um, and all that we, the journey that we are on with our indigenous relatives, uh, we have a great honor to welcome who is actually my bishop here in Saskatoon, Bishop Chris Harper. Uh, Bishop Chris was elected about three years ago here in the Diocese of Saskatoon, and he is uh, both Indigenous and a bishop, and you wonder, how can those two words be in one sentence? Well, uh, I hope he will uh, enlighten you a little bit about this, and we also welcome all those who are joining us on Facebook and on YouTube to capture some nuggets of wisdom here. So, uh, Bishop Chris, uh, we are asking you to get wired <laughs> here. Whole different meaning. Yes. <laughs> and uh, welcome to St. Pete's College. Oh, wonderful. Good to be here. I always struggle with these things. I'll do the best I can to not to, as my wife always says, play with the mic, uh, as I always do, notorious for it. I wanted to start our session uh, first to say that, number one, it's, it's good to be here. It's been many years since I've been uh, back at, uh, at the uh, St. Peter's College and the Abbey. And we used to come here when I was in the Diocese of Saskatchewan to uh, have our retreats here as well as our learning times and sometimes the special meetings that we've always uh, tried to have within the church. And uh, so I, I, I was blessed one time to be able to talk with the students then, and uh, it's, it's been uh, an interesting time since then, putting on the purple shirt and becoming a bishop. Um, see, I'm doing it again. I'm playing with this thing, aren't I? Okay, I've got to get this around because this always gets caught up. Welcome to everybody that's online. Um, I'm not going to try to stand behind this podium here and uh, too much, but I want to make you all very uncomfortable by walking out in front here and being with you all as well. Um, so I wanted to start with a, a, a passage of scripture. I am a bishop. I will use scripture, so uh, just a, head, a heads up and warning on that. I want to read from you from a new translation. This is the first, first Nations version, an indigenous translation of the New Testament. And um, it's, it, in fact, uh, this is a brand new book. But I wanted to share this passage with you. And it is using the indigenous translation or understanding, which is more descriptive and a mode of language. And so uh, it, it reads like this. This is a reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. So 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and beginning at verse 5. And it reads like this. Our creator is the one who has made us ready for this new body. The gift of his spirit is a proof to us that his promise is trustworthy and true. For this reason, our hearts remain firm, for we know that as long as we remain in this earthly body, yet we are not at home with our honored chief. As we walk the road of life, we trust in him even though we do not yet see him, for we walk by faith and not by sight. 
I wanted to start with that passage because to try to explain a little bit more about what it means to be indigenous as well as a bishop as within the church as a person of faith. Some of them stand in contradiction, especially as you've been finding and hearing through the news, especially for the findings that they've been finding from the residential schools. And it was once said to me that there should be no cemeteries in a schoolyard. Would you agree with me? There should be no graveyards in a schoolyard. No cemeteries. And unfortunately, that's what we do have by experience of what we have seen, of, of where the residential schools and cemeteries. And now they're finding unmarked graves. Starting with the 215 in Kamloops area, going up to the latest one, six, what was it, 106, 163, I think it was, this last one. And, it, and, and we struggle with trying to comprehend that reality in our world in our present world, and especially in a world of faith, where we are supposed to be the church. We're supposed to hold ourselves at a little bit higher standard. We're supposed to do a little bit better. We're supposed to be better in the what we say, how we do it, and how we express. And this is one of those problems and, con and co conflicts that we now live in right now. What does it mean to live in a world of faith? What does it mean to be a Christian in today's world where, where, where there's so much in conflict right now? I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely torturing my dear brother right now. I just want everybody to know that no, online. That's, that is totally fine. You know, I, I, I don't do it on purpose, but this is who I am. You, even, when, even when I preach, I have trouble standing behind the pulpit. And today, 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 today. We speak, we speak, speak about God's, God's, God's word, word, word. word. You know, and, uh, that's not me. I, I have to move. I have to, I have to be around you. And so, like I said, especially if you're in, sitting in front here, uh, uh, it makes you very, you know, can make you very uncomfortable because I'm, you know, questions. <laughs> so you either become the representative for everybody. But either way, what I'm trying to say is that right now, in what do we, how do we describe ourselves, and how do we exemplify what we are supposed to be as Christians, and at the same time, especially living in the legacy or the history of uh, of the uh, of the residential schools as Indigenous peoples. And so, for myself and my history. Um, just to give you a little bit I, uh, first as an introduction, I am Bishop Chris Harper. I am the 13th, a lucky number, 13th Bishop for the Diocese of Saskatoon in the Anglican Church, and I am, I believe, 15 out of 18 Indigenous Bishops for the Anglican Church of Canada. And I am number 15. So when you think of all these historical things, and you know, I, I, I was always one of those ones that when I was young and I was in school, I never wanted to be pointed out. I never wanted to be, uh, how do you say it, pulled to the front of the class. And I was always one of those ones that was very content to be behind the scenes. Today, you know, hiding like that. And speaking from, from a point, point of that where I was not the center of attraction. So this is what I do today, understand this, comes from... Uh, a, a need at the same time to address that little voice inside of me that says you can't, you shouldn't be doing this. I, 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 I'm one of those ones that when I grew up, my mother taught me and said to me, you are nothing, you will never be anything, don't try. That was what I grew up with as, 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 a, as an Indigenous youth because that's what was taught to her in the residential schools. You are nothing. You are an Indian. You'll never be anything. Don't try. And so I, I, I fight with myself on a daily basis, everything that I say, everything I do. I remember I did a, a, a funeral service for a OPP officer, Ontario Police, and there was RCMP, there was you know, a dignitaries, senators and every, that were there and everything else. And so I'm getting myself ready for the service, and they had the honor guard of all these RCMP and all these, and of course they choose the biggest guys, right? I'm six foot one and a half, and these guys were six, seven, you know, 12 feet tall kind of thing, you know, these huge, huge uh, uh, peace officers. And so they're all standing there, you know, like, you know, this, you know, like that, and here I come in and I, whew, whew, 
getting myself psyched up and ready to do the service. And the officer looks at me and he says, you nervous? I said, of course. I am nervous every time I speak. That's what keeps me humble. And I, I think maybe that's it, because that's who I am. I, like I said, I struggle. I still struggle, even to this day. I get woken up at 3 o'clock and that little voice screaming in my head, do you remember what you said six years ago? And you know, I go through these anxiety attacks and modes. I say this because you have this very same ability. All of you. If you've never been a public speaker, you can do it. Whatever you choose to do in life, and how, whatever direction you go, you in life, you will be strengthened to do so. So I'm going to try to stay still for a few minutes today. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness but I, I, I want to say that this, this is that who we are and what we are needs to be celebrated for each and every one of us it becomes part of our identity and how we talk and how we present things to, to others around us how we live and how we express our faith and life going forward for the most of my youth I tried to be anything else but indigenous because, again, it was one of those things that was not in vogue. It was not one of the best things to be. I was beaten up for it. I was assaulted. I was spat on. I was sworn at. I was threatened. And strangely enough, it continued on through life. I think it was Brother Lawrence that you know, you, 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 well, was written a, a few notes that said that, uh, of my life experience, of things that I've gone through in my life. I'm, you know, in, especially in EMS, I used to be a medic for, for over 20 years. I've seen everything. <laughs> I've delivered babies. I've held the hands of the dying. I've done rescue. I've done everything. I've seen what human beings can do to themselves and to others. I've seen the brokenness. I've seen the pain. And I've walked with a lot of people through this. But also in my own life experience, I can honestly say... I am one of, probably one of the few that can say this. I've been shot at. I've had knives pulled on me. I've had my life threatened. I've had a machine gun pointed at my face through a, a, a window when I was in Africa. I can tell you stories for days and days and days, but that's part of what it's taken me 60-plus years to get to. Being a student, I look at all of you and I envy you for all the potential that you are and all that you'll bring to this world. I truly do. I bless you for that. Be the best that you can be. Do the best you can. Respect yourselves and respect each other. That's how we're going to gain peace in this world. So I wanted to quickly talk very quickly about a, a, a few things about what it means to be in faith as an Indigenous individual as well as a, uh, a bishop within the church. The residential schools had changed the world in the way that we see ourselves, the identity of the indigenous peoples, going back to the whole thought and co concept of what it means to be an Indian. And so I, I, I've, I've worked to try to reconcile that with myself and as well as to be bring reconciliation to the church. I've always said that I am a man who walks in two worlds. And as a person who walks in two worlds, I recognize that both good and bad, and sometimes it becomes a very difficult path to follow and walk in. Out at the lake, have any of you ever had done that, or even at camp where they have those two ropes that you walk on and they're not really tied down and you're all over the place? And sometimes you end up doing the splits whether you like it or not. Or else you're going out to the lake and you have those two boards that you walk on and sometimes they, you know, they, whoever put them together, whether it be dad or uncle, and, and you, they, they get a little bit, you know, they have a sense of humor. Maybe they had one too many beers or something like that. And the path starts to go really wide. And before you know it, you're, you're almost spread eagle going down. 
boy, there's an image. Don't take that picture. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is what I mean by walking in two worlds. Sometimes it's easy. Many times it's very, very difficult to try to find the peace of what it means to be a treaty Indian as well as a Christian and now as a bishop. I still have and struggle with those points and thoughts where we have a lot of people who don't see me as capable, who need to basically nurse me along through uh, many conversations, or else if not that, to program me and tell me what I'm supposed to say and do. And I, 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 I've, I've, I, I tried to be calm about it, and I, at least I let them, you know, say their piece and do what they have to do because, well, they need to do it. And, you know, I, I try to be quiet about it and just be as, you know, peaceful and follow along. But at the same time, how I try to find my peace in faith. If I'm not pastoral and if I'm angry and mean, nobody's going to want to listen or talk to me. So I have to balance this in who I am in these two worlds. And so I, I, I wanted to, does everyone love show and tell? Sometimes, Bishop Chris, sometimes. So I'm going to try to share with you a few things. Um, this here is a cloth. And as you can see, it is these four wonderful colors. And these are what they call the indigenous colors or the indigenous flag that we use in a lot of ceremonies. And it, 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 it exemplifies or it shows the, all the nations of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious. You know, you heard the song, right? And so it has all the nations right here. It also exemplifies the stages of life that you go in, in the yellow, down here, I don't have an extra arm, the yellow, the beginning of things, and the different stages on this side to your senior years in the fight of youth, middle age, adult, elder, senior, roughly in about that category. Hold it, Bishop Chris, that's five. Okay, there's four. <laughs> My mind works a lot, too. So you have these colors, and they, they, they stand for us in, in, in uh, what we call the uh, traditional or the people, colors of the world, the stages of life, the seasons of the year, as well as the time of the day. And it can be used in so many ways of thoughts of how you try to understand what you are called to and what you walk in life. And uh, what, I, what my son did when I was consecrated as a bishop, he took upon himself to make a crozier for me. Now, this is the shortened version of it. Usually it stands about this high, but there's another section that's in between that I took out, so I thought it would be a nice piece, smaller piece to travel with. And you can see, again, the same four colors of white, yellow, red, and black. And this crozier uh, is, stands as for the office of the bishop. And, sorry about that. <laughs> it's just that it's easier, you don't, have to, you don't have to follow me. You can take it around. And the crozier stands as the office of the bishop. And so no matter where I go, I try to take, and I technically have three of them. One I travel with, this is my ceremonial one, as well as I have one at the cathedral, which is made out of silver and ebony, and it has uh, gems all around it and everything else like that. It's incredibly heavy. But this one here I'm able to travel with and, and, and everything. So uh, what, as Mary Louise goes around with it, is, is that also, which uh, she doesn't know about the story, is, is that it also has, my son made it with a story. And I'm going to do the best I can for the people online as well. This top part here is American oak. And American oak is probably one of the ones that is most well known. 
and how it also, uh, uh, also extends for where he lives. He lives in the United States. And he used American oak, then he used mahogany uh, for this lower part here, and sandwiched in between is, do you see what, what that is? What color is that? Like a red or a purple. And so that wood is called purple heart. And it stands as part of that long journey, the long path, the journey that all of us go through, the journey of faith. Because the bishops wear color purple because it, is a sign, uh, it is, stands as a symbol of the sacrifice. Because in, in, in Scripture it says that when Jesus was before uh, Pilate and before the cohort, in other words, the guards of, uh, uh, of the day, they put a purple robe on him because purple was always a symbol of royalty. And then they put that crown of thorns on him, and they said, and then they struck him, and they test, testify, who hit you? Tell us, who hit you? And they told, they, so they, they challenged him in that way, and they tried to mock him as the king of the Jews. And so purple, bishops still wear purple, but the purple heart he put in between the mahogany to try to sandwich it together to show the long road that we're always on. And Inside here, he made it as best as he could to try to make it into a circle. A circle holds a very special place for, for the indigenous peoples in the sense that the circle is, is that which balances all things out. We are on a journey all the way through. And all the way through the stages of the years of life in the different colors, all the nations coming together and in the center of that, always has been and will be the creator. I love the Benedictine cross, and so he made that with a blend, and that is also has also in a sandwiched in between is the purple heart of this cross. And my grandchildren were the ones that helped file and shape it and everything else, so that's why this cross is very special to me. And then together as a family, they put and wrapped each one of the dowels that hold and support the cross with the different colors of who we are as indigenous peoples. So like I said, this is my one crozier that I use uh, when I go traveling. I left out the middle section, and at the very bottom of the, this crozier, I asked them to put their names and the year. And so they put it on there. So there's Nathan, Charlotte, Rhiannon, Tristan on November 2018. So this one travels with me. And as a bishop, as a diocesan bishop, I hold it this way. So it's always facing out. If I was a suffragan bishop or a, sometimes a suffering bishop without an office, you hold it this way, backwards. And if you are, uh, 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 what uh, you might as well say, uh, uh, the bishop's chaplain who walks with me and, and, and uh, helps with the ministry, then they would hold it usually like this, holding it backwards. Traditions, different things that we do within the church. And so uh, this is one symbol of the office. And does anyone know why bishops historically have a crozier? No, Bishop Chris, please tell us. Okay. Um, the, you know, the, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you remember hearing that passage somewhere in church, in worship? The staff itself is that which corrects to guide the sheep, turn and direct them. And when the sheep get lost and wandering like most shepherds, they would take the crozier or the shepherd's hook and they would reach out and grab and pull them out of the bush or, or bring them back into the fold. And thus, that historical piece has always been passed on down to the bishops. So this is, stands as one symbol of what and who I am as the bishop, which also incorporates the use and the teaching of the, of the four colors and the cardinal points. And so you have this, and so people have asked me, well, which is the right direction? And the right direction is the one that you use. It's not an easy way. Because life is so full of rules and regulations, right? 
I know that as a bishop because I have to tell everybody that's not the right way you do this. But, uh, but in, among the indigenous circles and indigenous ministry, whatever's comfortable to you. I was a meeting one time when I was in uh, uh, um, Navajo land down south in Arizona, and they had this on the colors, and, and, and one of the elders came back and said, the colors are not in the right direction. And so we went and looked, and, and then when it took one of the other elders to say, we are in Navajo land. That's the way they do things. We will honor them by uh, uh, um, uh, letting them place the colors as they see fit. So it's important to respect others in their traditions of how they see things and how they understand things. And I wanted to share that with you. Um, as well as even the traditional ways we practice. Now, does, is anyone sense, 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 sensitive? No? Okay, because in the church, we use incense. These are just samples of, of, of incense that we use. Um, there's uh, the Celtic blend, and my favorite, Three Kings. So later on, uh, for those of you online, we don't have scratch and sniff yet, but um, I'm hoping that one day you'll come to church and that you'll smell them or uh, know what exactly what I'm talking about. But for those of you that are here at present, if you'd like to come and smell them and you know see what they are, they are also. I also have a beautiful floral blend of incense, of uh, resins and spices. And I also have a uh, Somalian uh, frankincense, as well as I have a uh, rose petal transfiguration from the monastery, rose petal incense. Amazing smelling stuff. And the incense that we use within the church itself is that to purify, to sanctify, and to bless as well as a symbol of God's presence and the, and, and, and the blessing of God uh, uh, for whatever we have for the altar. There's a whole wonderful method of doing how we sense the altar three times, then going off to the, the epistle side, going back to the gospel side, certain number of circles that you use. It's, oh boy, it's beautiful if you ever get to learn about it and see it. Um, as well as the different types of incense that we have that you can use and the amount of it. I used to serve in the church called uh, Smoky Toms, and it was called that because they used so much incense that sometimes it was almost hard to see the officiants or the celebrants at the front of the church. But it was also a symbol of how we come into worship and God's prayers rising up. As indigenous people, we did not have frankincense, we did not have the myrrh. So what we ended up using was the aromatics of our land. And so that to the side for now. We have what we use in our way, for example, sweetgrass. We also have sage. This bundle was made by my daughter and my granddaughter who gave it to me, and this comes from back home, so it's, it's, it's special to me. And then when I was traveling once in Toronto, I saw this wonderful blend, and it's got a, a sweet grass, sage, cedar, and tobacco in a, in a smudging bundle. So you can even use elements like that. For the sacred ceremonies, uh, especially in, in indigenous circles, this is buffalo sage. And this has a very um, amazing smell, and, and, and uh, especially when it's burnt, on how it flows and fills fills the room, as well as tobacco that has always been. And you wonder why tobacco is also considered one of the sacred medicines? No, Bishop Chris, please tell us to. Okay. Um, tobacco was special because especially how it had to get here through the, uh, through the transportation, especially of going through the river system to get finally up to us because you know, basically, where does, where does tobacco grow? In Virginia and uh, uh, Minnesota and those areas there. And that's why, because it was so expensive and so hard to get here, that's why it was considered sacred. How you burn it is you use it whatever elements you have. Some use shells, 
some use, and so for me, I use a, uh, a small, um, uh, cost, what do you call that? Cast iron frying pan. And so you use whatever you have that is available. And so I just wanted to show you some of those as well as what I travel with and what has been gifted to me. Everything has a story to it, and everything has its place and role. I have three feathers so far. This feather was gifted to me. Am I online still? I forget about that, right? Um, this feather here was gifted to me by my chief and counsel when I graduated college and seminary. And it was my uncle who presented to me and said, your family is proud of you. And it was very, very special to me. And still is. It's, it's one of my, my treasures. This feather was given to me by the uh, tribe uh, uh, from New York. I was in New York uh, do, to uh, assist with a presentation to the United Nations on the rights of indigenous peoples and, the, uh, uh, and that to, to challenge for Canada to sign on. The rest of the world has signed on to the rights of indigenous peoples, but Canada was one of the last ones to hold out on. Um, and so they presented this to me and they said, will you accept this? We don't know why, but we joined these two feathers together, this white feather and this other feather, the older feather. And I said, I would be honored to accept them. Number one, they're well-worn, well-used, old feathers. Secondly, this feather in the back here has seen a lot of battle and a lot of war warring. And it's chipped, it's got a lot of pieces missing out of it and it's tied, held together with a, with a leather band. And to me, this was one of those, uh, 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 you might as well say, sacred gifts, because it expresses everything in my life, trying to walk in two worlds and surviving many battles. I used to joke I'm a veteran of a thousand psychic wars. And how all of this used, you know, it symbolizes of who and what I am and what I have gone through in life. When I was consecrated as a bishop, the indigenous community of, of Saskatoon gifted me this feather. And it's got the three points on it, for the, for the, uh, not only for all of who, to remind myself who and what I am, as well as the faith of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that how important it is that we bring those elements, those understandings of what we teach as Indigenous peoples, and how we understand how it is the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional that all ties things together. Some say that it's not emotional, that it also can be an equated to the, uh, the mental of how we understand things. So these feathers stand something very special for me, and, and, and I, it travels me with me in this, in this box that I keep and I hold that's very special to me. Um, I also use it in, in certain services where I, I, I do a smudging and the smudging using the elements or the aromatics that we have within the land here. And I try to use those to, to bring us in, uh, especially in certain ceremonies, talking circles, uh, or, or if not that, just speaking circles to where, where there's a lot of emotion and it cleanses the space, cleanses the air, brings our spirit into right alignment. But symbols within the indigenous circle are, are one, a, a huge one. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm, I'm a bishop with hair. And usually I have it done into a braid. And this is about five years' growth. Um, I grow hair very easily on my head, but not so well on my face. Um, so I, I kind of treasure this, even though my wife says, it makes you look old, shave it. You know, but um, I, I, I like it because I can't grow 
uh, facial hair that, that well, but when I do, and I, I try to keep it as best as I can. I have no idea what I'd look like without a mustache, because I've had mine since probably about 17, so if you can see it's getting a little bushier now. But anyway, I'm, I'm telling you all of this because usually my hair is done in a braid. And the, and the braid symbolizes that of, 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 again, our physical, our spiritual, and our emotional, or sometimes our intellectual. And it ties them all together. And the longer your braid is, the closer you are connected to creation and to the creator. And so that's one of the reasons I keep my hair. But not only that, but it irritates the Christian community. Because as a bishop, you're supposed to look a certain way. And I say, no, this is who I am. If it makes you uncomfortable, why? Let's talk. And this is why it's important for us to understand exactly what we're talking about and how and why we do these kinds of things. Um, has anyone ever watched uh, that movie um, where they have... Uh, um, they go into a machine and they take on these other bodies, these huge alien bodies, and they're living on this foreign world, and they, and they connect their braid or their, to the animal. Avatar, right? Yeah. They borrowed that from the indigenous because, again, of us being able to tie ourselves closer to, the, to, to creation and to the creator. And that's one of the reasons that you see that. So now next time you watch the movie, you'll say, oh, what else did they do? Much the same as in Star Trek, they have a lot of other things, but I can go on. But I, I'm limited in my time with you. Um, last, if I can get my help here, I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is a flag. Hold the bottom down there at the bottom. Yep. Treaty 6 territory. How many of you do you use the, 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 the treaty acknowledgement here in, the, uh, in, in classes? Do you do it every day? Once a month? In the syllabus? Or as the church says, it's on a bulletin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but in the beginning, there was a, lot, a real push for everyone to, to, to be able to say the, uh, uh, the treaty acknowledgement. We stand in Treaty 6 territory, uh, Treaty of the, uh, uh, the Plains Cree, the uh, uh, um, Nakoda, the, the, the Salto, and it goes on and on, and uh, the homeland of the Métis. And the treaties themselves, I did a presentation on that yesterday, and the treaties were symbol of that coin where the indigenous and the settler, standing on equal ground, shaking hands and making a promise to each other and with each other. The treaties themselves were to be honored, but unfortunately the treaties themselves were never really adhered to and held up. And the reason I say that, because as a treaty Indian, when I turned 18, I should have received some ammo, fishing equipment, a net, a cart, I think a horse and maybe a cow. I'm still waiting. <laughs> so, um, Treaty 6, but uh, what does it say at the bottom of, uh, around the coin? As long... Right. So, as long as the sun shines, and as long as the rivers flow and the grass grows, does that sound like that's still happening today? That's right, Bishop Chris. The waters are still running. The grass is still growing. Well, these, that means the treaty should be still upheld and adhered to. Five minutes. And that's why it's important for us to understand now who your neighbors are about the treaties, who the indigenous people are. And at the same time, how we have been struggling to try to find our identity since the time of the residential schools. Trying to reconcile that physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. Trying to bring them back together into that beautiful, strong tie. There's that, the old, uh, um, I forget who it is, that, well, maybe it was 
some too, I'm not sure, that said that if you have one arrow, it's easy to break. But if you have a whole bunch of arrows, it's next to impossible to break. And that's why it's important for us to remember that together we are strong. As Indigenous people, together we are strong. All nations together across this land, and there's so many nations. And I've been blessed to meet everyone from the East Coast to the Mi'kmaq, going all the way to the West Coast, the Salish, the Haida, as well as the people up north to the, uh, to the Innu. Everybody, all of them, have the same issues and problems. And what we have inherited as a legacy and we're trying to work our way through that. And maybe we can do this together, all of us together, and especially for you, the next generation to come, the next generation going forward. You have a pivotal moment in history to make a difference, to make a difference, to eliminate racism, to eliminate so that we stop fighting with each other and start working together as, as, as God's creation as one voice, one hope, one love, one life, so that we can support each other. Maybe wars will stop. Maybe wars will stop. Violence will stop. We'll stop putting each other down and hurting each other and telling each other, this is where you have to walk. This is where you can walk. This is, you can't do that. But instead, we can start walking together as people with a strong faith that God loves us and that we are created, each and every one of us, for a special purpose. To understand the traditions that can be handed on down to us. Ladies, you are what we call indigenous circles as the life bringers. It's up to you to carry yourselves with respect and dignity. You teach the boys as a mom. You will teach the boys to be good leaders. But as my grandfather always did, when he was out in public, he always walked ahead of my grandmother to protect her. And he would always speak and do all the business, and she would always be quiet. But as soon as he walked into the house, he knelt down and took off the crown that he had outside and handed it over metaphorically to my grandmother, who then berated him and told him what he did not say right and what he did not do right. I remember this because I had the honored seat to sit beside my grandfather on his right-hand side in a small chair that I had behind, beside him, and he would sit there, uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, to listen to as she just berated him and told him how he needed to correct himself. And then at the very end, she goes back into the uh, kitchen to make him some tea. Then he'd always turn to me, and this is my grandfather. He had a great, amazing sense of humor. And he turned to me, and he'd always say, did you hear the way she spoke to me? Me, mind you. <laughs> and we would laugh and laugh. But ladies, carry yourselves with the honor that is due. You are the life bringers. Men, guys, we play a small part in this. We play a very small part in this, but we are equally important. In the indigenous circles, it was always the women that were the true leaders. They, it was a matriarchal system, but it was up to the men to enforce those, what they were told. I know this because I've been married now for, what, 41 years, 42 years? I still learn something new and exciting about my wife every day. I've learned a long time ago I will never understand her because she's a woman. But at the same time, she smiles and she learns something new about me every day because I'm a man. Respect who you are, especially in your youth. Ladies, all I can say is blessings to you. You are the life of tomorrow. Know that and understand that. Acknowledge that. Without you, us men are doomed. The world is doomed. So, all I'm saying in conclusion is, all of you have a special purpose. What it is, you may not know. I've met very few people. Oh, yes, by the time I'm 22, I'm going to 
and then you check with them when they're 22 and none of that's happened. Trust and believe there is a purpose for each and every one of you. How special you are. You are here for a reason. You are here for a purpose. And only the Creator and you will find that out. The Creator knows. Scripture says, before you were created, I knew you. From your mother's womb, I brought you forth. And that believe that, that the Creator knows you. And that passage where it says, for God so loved the world, is, is, is that which, which binds us together. In conclusion, which usually, according to Archbishop Mark McDonald, says I have 10 minutes more, <laughs> just to totally scare uh, you know, Reverend Mary Louise. But I want to close with this. Closing words from Jude. And it says this, in the, in, in, in um, what am I in here? Jude, Jude 11. And, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, in Jude, and the last words, in the, starting at verse 24. Now to the one who is able to keep you from stumbling, who can make you pure and blameless, so that at the great joy you can stand before his bright, shining greatness. To the great spirit who has set us free and made us whole through our honored chief, Creator sets free, Jesus, the Chosen One, bright, shining greatness, beauty, power, and chiefly to rule to Him from time before all days, today and from the time beyond the end of all days. From the beginning to the end, the Creator is with us. May you find your journey, your path. Remember as I always say, and you know, as it's been told to me, we are spiritual beings and physical bodies, each and every one of us. There's more than just the here and the now. More than this. Enjoy the day. Rule the day. Carry yourselves with dignity through the day. To all of you online, remember how special you are and that the Creator and his son, creator who sets free, Jesus, knows you and blesses you and calls you to the ministry that only you can do. I can't do what you do. I can't do what you do. I can't do what you do. But together, we can change the world. And that's what the creator's brought us here for, to make a difference. So in closing, I want to say thank you for this opportunity, this time to be able to talk with you and share with you. I encourage you, keep up your studies. I envy you. I love school. It doesn't sound thick. And like I said, so again, thank you very, very much for the time that I've had with you. And at the same time, blessings to you all. Thank you, Bishop Chris. I think what, what I glean from this, and I've heard him speak several times, but every time I see how he, I hope you noticed it too, how he learns and, and shows us how the two worlds can be woven together. It is an incredible source of grief and sadness that that has not happened historically. But it is happening now. It is time and the, the soil in, the, in Canadian culture is tilled for that to happen, both in the church and outside the church. And I think with your lovely show and tell, you actually are a very concrete example of how the two worlds can actually enrich one another. And I know you could go on for hours, so know that this is only the beginning. We will have you back. And... Uh, Thank you, all of you, for coming, especially also those, thank you for those who are online. But if, if you don't have a class at 1 o'clock, uh, Bishop Chris will hang around for a bit if you want to come and talk to them. So thank you again, Bishop Chris.